which was Christ open for delivery. We talked about what that was, and I say this because last month we learned about who Jesus is and his many characteristics as a teacher, a healer, a deliverer. And many of us were able to experience what it means to be taught, what it means to be healed physically or spiritually or emotionally, and also to be delivered. And knowing this today, we're going to start a series that has to do with why Jesus was all these things. Why was he known as a teacher? Why was he known as a healer? Why was he known as a deliverer? And this is because ultimately Jesus cares about our stories. Jesus cares about our stories. So this month's sermon series is going to be titled, Jesus Cares About Your Story. Jesus cares about your story. Jesus cares so much about our story that he actually encourages us to share it. In Revelation, Christ, through his angel, tells the apostle John something about the power of testimony. In Revelation 12, verse 10 to 11, he says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, he's talking about Satan, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, salvation, and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. This scripture tells us that our testimonies Give us victory over the devil's strategies and accusations. Amen? Sometimes people don't know. It seems like the devil's always beating me up. Well, here's a way to beat him back. Through your testimony. Our testimonies encourage others that listen, and it provides hope for their lives. If God can help them, God can help me. If God came through for them in that situation, then maybe God will come through for me in my situation. Amen? Yes, this month, this whole month, uh, we're going to be highlighting some of our stories here at New Harvest Anaheim. So I asked a few people to share their story via testimony, one for each day. And for those that don't know, a testimony is a sharing of one's encounter with Jesus that changed their life to the point of salvation. It's not a sermon. It's not a Bible study. It's them testifying what God has done for them. So today I'd like to call up Roger to come up and share his testimony. I asked him to come on up. Roger's one of our ushers and care ministers. So he's going to share a little bit. Thank you. Uh, good morning, you know, Harvest Anaheim. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to share with you my testimony. Um, I try to make it short, but I felt like it was important to include uh, important details. So I'm Roger. I'm glad to see you here. I'm glad that you made it and you didn't miss this. Um, I want to say it's only part of my testimony because life is never the same after you experience breakthrough in your life. When I really learned to trust in God wholeheartedly, I was in absolute fear and desperation. I had no certainty of my future or destination. So what was Roger like before he learned about God? Lonely. I never went without, but always felt like lonely. Then grew into hanging out with the popular crowd and my older cousins because that's who I looked up to, I guess. I started doing bad things here and there, and then more frequently, long story short, snowballed into a self-centered and very self-destructive person. What followed were actions and behaviors that were anything but reasonable, dangerous behaviors that often did not end well. From 15 to 32, I just ran amok, problem after problem with police, neighbors, at work, on my way to work, at home, everywhere. My home was also neglected and torn to pieces. Um, I was never prepared for how quick things would happen after the years passed so fast, literally like a blur. Um, I was so in denial and lost. Um, The way I carried myself was shameful. I had 
have a good little business and make good money. Bills were paid, bank accounts were growing. Trips here, trips there. I even had a motorcycle. <laughs> but my family never came first. And who is this Jesus? Like, I was so wrong, thinking I had it all, and I was free to do as I pleased. During this time, I first attended a Christian church, but all I did was show up and nothing else. I had one foot in, but the rest of my body out. It was like I never really had time for God. I learned that this is called being lukewarm. Later, I learned how serious this was, and I believe this is why my problems had got so bad. Um, I had experienced a few downfalls, but they weren't so serious. Um, I had not learned my lesson. I felt the punishments were not that expensive or harsh. Um, the truth is I had reached insanity. I was um, insanity is repeating behaviors and expecting different results. Pride and denial made themselves comfortable inside of me until one day God decided enough is enough. I experienced a very scary tragedy. Um, I caused a really bad accident which nearly killed three innocent people. This is something that is very hard for me to talk about because in a blink of an eye, my life changed. I was on my way home that day planning to attend my tia's barbecue. It was a birthday party, my birthday party, which I never made it to, by the way. I had plans for work, plans for next week, plans for the plans, but never considered God's plans. I had lost everything, my family, my work, money, tools, my freedom, even my privacy. I was stripped of everything and given different clothes, the same clothes that I would be wearing for I don't know how long. The crash was so bad I couldn't sleep for like a month. The initial sentence was seven years and all I could think about was my son. Who was gonna help my wife? Who's gonna pay the rent? Where will my family go? Who can open the home for them? How this, how that, questions and worries all and all doubts and fears began to creep up. Feeling the stress of my situation and the shame and guilt of hurting those people was overwhelming. I didn't want my family or my son to see me. This is where I surrendered to God. I could not fix any of it on my own. I had no power or authority to do anything. All I, uh, all I had was lots of time to think of what a horrible person I was and how I could have prevented this or done that. I could not change what was already done. One day reading a scripture, I realized God can give you everything but also takes it all away because he doesn't like pride. Um, and also he wants us to be sober-minded. He wants us to come to him and he even uh, asks that if it's necessary for you to lose a limb because that's what makes you sin, like, you know, cut off an arm. Um, some of you may relate or if you know somebody who suffers from alcoholism or addiction, at some point you may have seen or experienced a not so pleasant moment or side of them, perhaps an episode or an argument where things were said and done that was no going back. This is where I truly found God. I found peace only when I prayed. I prayed for forgiveness. I spent most of my days praying for healing and recovery of my victims. I slowly made a routine of uh, attending church and keeping busy. Time was moving, slow but moving. Life continued. This was my time to simply be still. There was many riots and many fights, multiple stabbings and just random situations. There was always the risk of getting hurt or the uncertainty of ever coming home due to the risk of deportation. Little by little things began to smooth out and somehow work themselves out. By now, I was getting ready to be transferred. Months later, I met with the committee who would decide my future with just a few clicks of their mouse. Here I prayed before I entered and um, they shipped me out to fight wildfires. Um, this was not very fun. It was very difficult and dangerous work. Slave work if you really look at it. But it was my cross to carry and with God's help, I persevered. Here I began to see God's work and the more I looked, the more I found. I even found books by no coincidence that helped me to get closer to God. I continued to pray and go to Bible studies. The funny thing is, no matter where they sent me, there was always persons who believed in God. And sometimes the radio station, the only radio station there was, was a Christian station. Um, I, I, um, my wife and son were also doing well. I learned they were attending New Harvest Anaheim. And 
They were both very happy. I continued my routine, but as my time with there was coming to an end, one of my friends was picked up by immigration. All those worries came back, but only briefly this time. My wife, relatives, and I had trust that no matter what, we would be all right, even if we, if we had to start from scratch. We prayed and hoped for a miracle. I fast-forwarded everything for time constraints, but church, here I am today by the grace of God. Many blessings have happened and continue to happen. I hope that you heard more than just one uh, testimony in this or see the blessings as I did during my toughest times. I remind myself constantly of how great God's love is and how miraculous he can be. God's hand and his protection covered me and brought me home almost as if I had never left. Today, I see my experience not as a punishment or a dumb mistake. I thank God for allowing me to grow closer to him through all of this. I thank him for using this experience to change me. I don't know how else I would have changed or where I would be. On my first morning home, I went to the pantry and I saw it was full to the roof. I couldn't believe it. I broke down in, in emotion. I, I broke down. I realized in that moment that God did in fact watch over my family like I had prayed over and over. I also prayed, God, please don't let my family feel lonely. And this church was so nice to them. It was like our little family was bigger now. <laughs> Yesterday, it was May 4th, and brothers and sisters, I believe that it is by no coincidence that I was asked to share this with you today. It marks six years since the accident happened. Um, today, I stand before you feeling so blessed to be here with you and not meeting you through a glass or a phone call, uh, collect phone call. I've been home with my family two years already. God, help me. Um, to cut my sentence by doing college classes and firefighter stuff. I give all the praise to Jesus for carrying me and my family through, through this, and I give God the Father all the glory because he gave us favor. I want to bring honor to God by being a good person and speaking to others about God. I would just want to end this by saying that he did lots of work in me, and there's still much more that I have to do myself. I hope that this testimony reaches many hearts and that it is encouraging to see that if God saved me, forgave me, chose me, rescued me, redeemed me, and loved me, he can do the same for you. So, thank you. Let's give it up for Roger, amen? Praise God. Wow. Wow, what an awesome, awesome testimony, amen? To hear how God has taken a life that maybe at one point maybe was destructive to self and possibly the others as he explained and, and now has changed that track and idea that the enemy had for his life and, get, and, and gave God's plan an opportunity in Roger's life. Praise God. Let's give it up for Jesus. Wow. That's a powerful testimony. I should just do altar call right now, right? That's <laughs> Praise God. What an awesome testimony. Thank you, Roger. And uh, wow. You know, Today's sermon, I would like to talk about what Jesus cares about. He cares about your story. You just heard a story right now of somebody's life. And that story is real. It's not made up. It's a real story. But there's something throughout every story that you're going to hear, and there's something about our story also. Our story is directly linked to relationships. And why do I say that? Because Jesus cares about your relationships. Jesus cares about your relationships. Nobody here lives alone. 
in life. They are connected to someone, some way or another. Some by choice, some not. Some wish they didn't have certain relationships. Some, you know, had no choice in those relationships. Like many of you could not have picked your parents. We love our parents, but some people, I've heard people say, I wish I could have had a different parent. I've heard people say that. Those are relationships that were endowed on you. And there's a story in the Bible that clearly depicts how Jesus cares about our relationships. And it's a story of a woman at the well. And that's found in the book of John, chapter 4, verse 4 to 26. It's a long portion of scripture, but I need you to really pay attention to every piece of it because I think it's like three slides long because it tells a story. Now, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away (coughs) into the city to buy food. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked me, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us this well and drank of it, himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to him, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of living, springing water up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. See, he was talking to her about spiritual water, but she was thinking of a lifetime supply of Arrowhead. And he said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. I'm repeating that. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. Then the one, then, and when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. At this point, his disciples came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Church, we should hunger to do God's work. 
Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for the harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. From that city, check this out, guys. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. See the power of testimony? He told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word, and they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you say that we believe, for we have heard it ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. All this started with the conversation that Jesus had with the woman at the well. Here we have a Samaritan and a Jew, Jesus, and they met at the same place. Now understand something. The Jews were not supposed to go through Samaria under any circumstances. But yet Jesus said to his disciples when they were on their way to Galilee, we need to stop over here in Samaria. And the disciples, I love the disciples, because they knew the law. They knew Jesus knew the law, but they didn't question him. They trusted in him. They're saying, okay, Jesus said to go to the Samaritan village. Uh, we're not supposed to go over there. Okay, Jesus. But they went anyway. They followed him. How many of you know that sometimes we have to have blind faith when it comes to Christ? Sometimes we can't reason with God. Amen? Sometimes we try to figure God out, but we can't. And the disciples had come to a point in their life where they didn't question Jesus and say, Jesus, I forbid you from entering the Samaritan town. We are Jews. They are Samaritan. They were like, okay, Jesus, let's go. I don't know what he's up to. I don't know where Jesus is taking us, but okay. And sometimes that's how we have to live our life. Jesus, this doesn't make sense, but I'm going to listen to you. You see, when he gets there, he sends them on a mission. He says, hey, you guys, go get some food. And they let Jesus rest. The Jews were not to have any dealings with Samaritans. The Samaritans were actually enemies of Judah. They were enemies of the Jews. And if you want to know about the history, look it up in Ezra chapter 4, verse 1. And this is where the, am, the enmity comes. They were declared enemies of the Jews. The Samaritans were upon all occasions very malicious to the Jews. They were very malicious. They would do sneaky things to sabotage Jewish things. So like, for example, some Samaritans would go to the Jewish wells and they would poison the wells just because they didn't like the Jews. But the Jews weren't that innocent either. The Jews were extremely malicious against the Samaritans. They were so malicious against them that they looked upon them as having no part in the resurrection. So they technically declared in their teachings, there's not even salvation available for the Samaritans. They're not even able to ever get into heaven because they're the enemies of God's people. There's no way. So even if a Samaritan says, I want to get right, sorry, you're a Samaritan, get out of here. There's no hope for the Samaritans. They were excommunicated and cursed. For the Jews said that they were cursed by the sacred name of God, by the glorious writing of the tablets, that's the Ten Commandments, and by the curse of the upper and the lower house of judgment, that's the Pharisees and said seditical laws that they had with this law. Their government proclaimed them unholy, unsacred, unrighteous. There was no hope for a Samaritan. You guys ever heard of the parable of the Good Samaritan? You see, Jesus was already trying to break down those mindsets, those prejudices. He was trying to, 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 to show people, like, you guys think you know people, but you really don't know people because you don't have a relationship with them. No Israelite was allowed to eat anything from a Samaritan, let alone drink from their well. And what did Jesus do? Let me have a drink. So the woman was like, 
why are you as a Jew asking me for a drink? Even they knew, like, we're not even supposed to be talking, dude. Number one, he was, a, he was a man, she was a woman, so a woman and a man were not supposed to talk in public alone. He was not allowed. That's why it says the disciples were like, why is he talking to a girl? What's going on over here? But see, Jesus had another plan. And he engages this woman whom he knows has this perception culturally. And he says, hey, give me a cup of water. See, that's what Jesus does. He challenges our culture, church. Did you know that? He challenges our culture. Many people are religious culturally, but they are not at all spiritual. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? But thank God Jesus doesn't look at people the same way we do or the same way Samaritans look at Jews or the same way Jews look at Samaritans. Amen? This woman's meeting with Christ at the well reminds us if you're biblically aware of certain things, this meeting at the well is not the first time there was a meeting at the well. If you read your Bible, you would know that it should remind you of the stories of Rebecca, of Rachel, and Jethro's daughter, who all met husbands, good husbands, at the well. Who were these men that they met? They met Jacob, they met Isaac, they met Moses, all at the well. Interesting. These are all patriarchs. You know what a patriarch is? They are the founders of the Jewish religion. And all these men, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, met their wives at a well. And now Jesus is showing up at a well. And what is he telling this woman? I want to be your spiritual husband. Here Jesus became the spiritual husband of this outcast woman at the well. Here Jesus speaks to a woman that was minding her own business when she showed up. And Jesus unexpectedly was right there asking for water. And as a result, she was converted and she received salvation. Think about that. When was the last time you went to a well and found your wife, men? When was the last time, woman, sisters, that you went to a well and found your husband? You see, there's something significant when the Bible repeats things over and over again, and it's always a godly woman and a godly man that God brings together at the well. And Jesus was saying something. He says, I am the living water. Those who come to me and drink shall never thirst again. He is sometimes found by those who aren't even seeking him. This woman wasn't trying to find Jesus. She just wanted to get water. And then Jesus gets into her story. He starts to talk to her about her relationships. He knew what he was doing when he said, hey, go call your husband. He's like, I don't have a husband. He's like, I know. You had five. And the one you're with right now, you're shacking up with. You're not even married to him. But see, it was with gracious design, church, that Christ brings this up. He graciously awakens her conscience to slightly open that wound of her guilt. Because she was living with a man that was not her husband. And Jesus cares about her relationships. So he first pricked her to the heart, and then he healed her. He didn't just get to the point, you're a sinner and you're going to hell because you're shacking up, girl. But you know what's sad is some Christians street preach like that. Turn or burn. If you don't know Jesus, you're going to hell. 
Is it true? Absolutely. But let's learn a little bit about how Jesus won people to the Lord. He won people to the Lord through a gracious conviction. Observe how mildly Christ tells her of this. He doesn't call her a bad name for these types of women. Oh, but in the world? Oh, you're being a fill in the blank. But he tells her, he whom you live with now is not your husband. And then he leaves it to her to say the rest. I want to make a point of this. In verse 29, it alludes that he had a long conversation with her. That's not in Scripture. And he tells, it says this, that she testifies to the Samaritans, he has told me everything I have ever done. Jesus cared about this woman's story that he listened. That he listened. He knows what we've done, church. But he listened to her story. She probably told him why the first marriage didn't work. She probably told him why the second marriage didn't work. She probably told him why the third marriage didn't work, the fourth marriage, the fifth marriage. And maybe she explained that, why get married? They always end up in divorce. So I'll just not marry this guy. Actually, I have heard that theory. I've been married twice, and it doesn't work. So I'm not going to marry this guy, and it's actually going pretty good. How many of you guys have heard that? I have. I've heard that mindset. And he listened to her. And, and, and he spent time with her at the well. Did you know that Jesus desires to spend time with you? Did you know that he desires to speak to you and listen to you about your story, good or bad? You know, Jesus could have easily been like, I'm chilling at the well, waiting for the disciples. I'm hungry. They're taking long. Oh, here comes a woman. The Jewish law forbids me to be alone with this woman, so I'm going to leave. He's obeying the law. Or he could have been like, oh, here comes a woman. Uh, And she's a Samaritan. The, the, The Jewish law forbids me to speak to Samaritans. Or he could have been like, I don't want your stinking water. You're a Samaritan. Let alone, let's talk about your life. What perceptions do you have about people that keep you from reaching out to them? What perceptions do you have and thoughts that you have, whether cultural or even spiritual? Because Jesus was spiritual. And all those three reasons I just gave you are spiritual justifications to not talk to that person. And Jesus pretty much threw all of those aside. Why? Why? Because he wanted a relationship with that woman. He cared about her soul more than he cared about the law. Did you know, church, that you could be so spiritually minded that you are no earthly good? It's good to be spiritual. But don't let your spirituality get to a place where you're not even effective in the things that matter in people's lives. Notice, the scripture does not detail all the things of her life, does it? Because I believe that Jesus didn't share those details with John, who wrote the, the, the Gospel of John, for a reason. That was his story with her and her story with him, and it was a personal relationship that he was seeking. Church, can I tell you, you can trust Jesus? Jesus is not a gossip. There's some people you can't tell anything to, right? You tell them a little bit, and they already know how to finish the story, even though you haven't told them the end. They know it. Jesus cares about relationships. He cared enough about this woman's life and soul that he pretty much said, I don't think it's a good idea that you're with this man. 
How many of you know that God is supposed to get in our business? How many of you know that it is Jesus' business to get in our business? Many people want to come to church, but they don't want to have God in their business. Jesus is not the type of God that we go to church to receive and then we leave him at the church. Jesus is the type of God that when we come to the church, we accept Jesus and Jesus goes home with us. There's another scripture that reveals God's concern for our relationships. And it has to do with unbelieving spouses. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 12 to 16. This is what it says. If you have a wife who is not a believer, you should not divorce her if she will continue to live with you. And if you have a husband who is not a believer, you should not divorce him if he will continue to live with you. The husband who is not a believer is set apart for God through his believing wife. And the wife who is not a believer is set apart for God through her believing husband. If this were not true, your children were not, would be, un, I'm sorry, if this were not true, your children would be unfit for God's use. But now they are set apart for him. But if your husband or wife who is not a believer decides to leave, let them leave. When this happens, the brother or sister in Christ is free. God chose you to have a life of peace. Wives, maybe you will save your husband. And husbands, maybe you will save your wife. You don't know what will happen later. This is a powerful scripture, church. God wants you to have hope for your unsaved relatives, no. Your unsaved kids, no. This says God wants you to have hope for your unsaved spouse. Yes, he wants you to have hope for them, but that's not what this is saying. I love what it says here in the last scripture. It says, you don't know what's going to happen later. Pastor, you don't understand. My husband gets on my nerves. He's rude. He's mean. He's unthankful. He's ungrateful. He ignores me. He doesn't take me out on dates. He just wants to work, 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 and watch sports, 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 sports. You know what? I, I, don't, I don't need a man like that. I want a godly man. Maybe God has something for me in the church. Maybe I should just leave this guy and find a godly man in the church. God says, no. It's through your salvation that he's even saved and has grace on his life. Now, if he decides, hey, I'm, I'm out of here, that's on him. Same thing with the woman. Husbands, if you've got a wife that's unsaved, oh, pastor, I can't handle her. I'm just going to leave her, you know. She doesn't even want to come to church, and I'm tired of this. In my house, me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Thus saith God. So I'm going to divorce her. That's not what the scripture says. See, church, God cares about your relationships. He cares about your relationships with your spouse specifically. Even the unsaved spouses. See, your continued relationship with this unsaved spouse is producing a level of grace on their life. Because you're saved. Hopefully you're not at a place where you're like, well, I don't want God to have grace on him. Or I don't want God to have grace on her. But you do want grace on your kids, right? Well, the Bible says that when you're in that relationship, even though they're unsaved, there's a level of grace that makes them fit for the kingdom of God. The moment you remove your covering from that unsaved spouse, your covering for your children is removed also. That grace will remain on them until they get saved. Do you have that hope? And if you are the unsaved spouse here, I don't know lives here totally, but if you're an unsaved spouse here, 
Be thankful to God that your spouse is saved. Because God is helping you because of them. God is having grace on them, on you because of them. It ain't you. You might think it's you. Not according to scripture. The only reason you walk with favor is because your spouse is saved. And they haven't left you and divorced you. See, God sets them apart because they're married to you. Even though they are currently unsaved. This is the power of our relationship with people, church. You see how important relationships are? You see how important God cares about our relationships? Because to God, relationships equal salvation. Where else are they going to hear the gospel if the person that they live with doesn't want to share it? God has hope that you, as an example, will be able to testify, like the awesome testimony we heard today from Roger, that they will be able to testify to that unsaved spouse. I'm pretty sure that there was a level of God's grace on Roger because Lisa was saved, his wife. And now he's saved, just like the scripture said. I mean, she could have been like, oh, that's it, I'm done. Bye. But she had faith. She had hope. See, this is the power of our relationship with people for the sake of their salvation. Your faith can spare them and put more grace on someone that otherwise wouldn't have it if they quit that relationship. But here's something important to note. Jesus cares more than anything about your relationship with him. More than anything. Yes, he wants you to care about your spouse and your kids. But more than anything, he wants you to prioritize your relationship with him. So during the time of Jesus' call, of, you know, he called over his disciples at one point because he was raising them up. He was training them. He would send them out to cities to pray and to heal and do all that. And during one of those times, he calls over his 12 disciples and he was prepping them to go and preach the gospel two by two. And he tells them this, Matthew 10, 34, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves the father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or their daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it and whoever loses their life will find it for my sake. Man. Jesus, whoa. This sounds like Jesus is contradicting the fact that he cares about our relationships, doesn't it? It sounds like he's contradicting what he just, I thought Jesus cared about our relationships. And over here he's saying he came to bring a sword and division between a mother and a daughter and a father and a son and a mother-in-law and an in-law and a son-in-law or daughter-in-law. And everyone's going to be a member of their own family. They might be an enemy. But what Jesus is saying here is that he knows how people can be, especially in family. You notice Jesus is strictly focusing on family. He didn't say your neighbor. He didn't say your, your boss. He's focusing on mothers, daughters, sons, fathers, and in-laws. That's family. What Jesus is saying, people are going to want to follow me, and because of that, there's going to be division in family. Not all the time. That's not what he wants. But he knows how opinionated family members can be sometimes with us, church. He knows that some people in family will write you off if you change. If you don't drink with them no more. If you don't do everything that you guys used to do with them anymore. If you don't comply to what their idea of family is, they cut you off. 
What do you mean you can't come to your niece's birthday party because you have to go to church? That's ridiculous. What do you mean you don't want to go to church every Sunday? Sundays are for family breakfast, etc., etc. Softball, baseball, basketball, sports, whatever. That's what that's for, and then they start getting mad at you. How many of you have ever had a family get mad at you because you want to do something for God instead of with family? Oh, I think you're taking this Jesus thing way too serious. Family members will tell you straight out what they think because of your family. The unfortunate thing is sometimes people give in. We know people that used to come to church all the time. But a spouse may be upset because Sunday mornings were for breakfast. So eventually that person stops coming because they're trying to keep peace in the home for the sake of peace and breakfast. I'm not going to go to church no more. But Jesus basically said, those who truly will follow me understand this. There's going to be division sometimes. Well, go by yourself. Enjoy your pancakes. I'm going to church. It might cause an argument. That's not peaceful, is it? But God brings a sword. He says, I did not come to bring peace. I came to bring the sword. What he's basically saying is, I know when people want to choose me over their own family, there's going to be some fighting going on. But what happens is sometimes families are like, I don't want to fight. I just want to have peace. Didn't Jesus say to be at peace? Yeah, but Jesus also said, I came to bring the sword when, when it comes, comes to that. But pastor, I'm tired of fighting. You can be tired of fighting in certain areas, but the battles that are worth fighting are the ones that have to do with your relationship with Christ. Fight for your relationship with Christ. Fight for your relationship with Christ. Fight for your relationship with Christ. I love my family, but if they try to come between me and Jesus, sorry. But there's a lot of people that are not willing to make that decision. Because all well, family is everything. No, that's not true. God is everything. He says, first seek the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and everything else shall be added unto you. As a matter of fact, the more I've gotten closer to Christ, the better my relationships to family have become. But the devil tries to lie to us at that initial onset because there's that little uncomfortable feeling that all of a sudden you're drawing the line. I'm not going to miss. I'm not going to be this. I'm not going to do this no more. I want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't celebrate that. I, and eventually everyone's like, oh, what? Comments, 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 comments. But eventually they stop. And eventually that covering comes upon them because you're praying for them. And eventually God begins to change them. Jesus knew this because many of us would decide to serve him radically. That some people closest to us would object to the point that it would cause strife and division in relationships that you have with family. Does Jesus want division? No, of course not. He's just preparing us because he knows how important family is and how people get. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Anybody here? Experiences with that? See, that's what I love about Jesus. He just keeps it real. He keeps it real. People try to say, well, I thought Jesus was the prince of peace. Yes, internal peace. Spiritual peace. Internally. Not peace in your home. Not peace at work. There is a level of peace that follows you because you carry that peace. But he doesn't promise us peace in those areas outside of peace with him. Does that make sense? Jesus keeps it real. In verse 22, he says, You will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Parents of teenagers, they will sometimes make you feel guilty for loving God because they feel, why can't you just be like all the other parents? You're so strict. You're so mean. I hate you. Jesus said it. You will be hated by even your own kids. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And because you're standing firm, there's a covering on your kids. And eventually your kids come along. Amen.
in closing, Jesus cares about the relationships that we have. Who those people you have relationships with matter to God. Who your boyfriend is, your girlfriend is, matters to God. And he wants to have the type of relationship with you where he'll be able to tell you, you know what, I don't think this one's for you. You know what, this one's a loser. You know what, this one's desperate. You know what, this one's got issues and is on the rebound. You know what, this is not the one you want to have kids with when you get married. Because God knows the future. He knows everything about everyone, just like he knew about that woman. So are you going to trust your intuition, or are you going to trust God's intuition on who you choose? For those of you that are already married, there's that scripture. Do not divorce an unbelieving spouse. Have faith for them. Hold on to your faith, and it is through your faith that eventually they'll change. God can change people. And mostly important, what he cares about is the quality of the relationships that you have. And even on top of that, most importantly, the quality of relationship you have with him. With him. Are you willing to say, yes, God, I love you so much, I don't care who hates me. You know, it baffles my mind when people leave the church because their friends left the church. Because that tells me you're more importantly prioritizing your friendships than you are your friendship with God. But I'm alone. We were friends. We were buddies. We were close. And what, you're not close with Jesus? You don't follow people. You follow Jesus. Period. Because people, one day they're here, the next day they're here. One day they love God, the next day they don't. You can't follow people's feelings. Because people's feelings are like this. You don't want to go on a roller coaster with them. Your main priority friendship should be a friend of God. Abraham was called a friend of God. You know why? Because he didn't care what anybody said when it came to Jesus. Hey, Sarah, we're leaving. Where are we going? I don't know. Get the stuff and let's go. What do you mean you don't know? Too bad. Let's go. Why? God said. Ah. Oh. He was more concerned about his friendship with God than he was about his marriage with his wife. Thank God Sarah had some faith in her husband. You tell that today to anybody. They'd be like, hey, babe, we're going to go. They'd be like, yeah, all right, see you. I live in my job, my kids, my work, my car, my weather, whatever. I'm good. I'm Gucci. Whatever the case may be. And you want to stay put because it's just too much of a discomfort. But you know what? When you follow God, regardless of the comforts of this world and regardless of the relationships of this world, God begins to look at you as, oh, he's my friend. She's my friend. Because they don't let nothing, not even relationships, get in the way of our relationship. It's a challenge, church. This is a challenging sermon. I'm not sitting here saying this is an easy sermon. But do you want to be known as a friend of God? <sighs> you know, it was one of the most interesting things that Jesus did in the last with his disciples. He called him, he called all 12 of them his friends. Even Judas. He didn't call them his disciples. He didn't say, I am your master. He says, you are my friends. You know why he said that? Because there had already been two church splits with Jesus already. When he had 72 disciples and he had 120 disciples. They, at one point he had a church 120 strong. Everybody left, except his 12 homies. And then he had another church after that. After it went down from 12, went back up to 72. He had, a, he had a church. About 25 more people than us, 72. And then before that, he had a church twice the size as this. Three times the size as this. That's a lot of 
Big church, huh? Woo, praise God. Any pastor would love that. But then he gave a sermon. And they're like, this guy's crazy. He's asking too much. This is too uncomfortable for me. I'm going to go to another church. And he was left with the same 12 homies. You see, Jesus considers people that follow him regardless of who follows him, who else follows him, his homies, his friends. Let's be friends of God. Don't matter who stay, doesn't matter who goes, I'm staying on Jesus. <laughs> Jesus said the same thing. And you know what's really sad now is people in the American culture look at the size of church as an indication of of God's favor or as an indication of, um, uh, gosh, that went out of my mind, but they, they look at like, oh, there's something right about that church because it's big. And if it's a small church, oh, there's something wrong with that church because it's small. But if you look at scripture, Jesus turned to his 12 disciples. It's a pretty small church, right? 12. And he said, are you guys going to leave me too? And they said, no, where are we going to go? You have the words of living life. You have the words of life in you. They recognized it. Church, we need to recognize the voice of God. Don't get blinded by size. Don't get blinded by voices, what people say, what people think. People are opinionated, families and friends. They'll tell you what they think, right? But what I say is, it's okay. You can listen to everybody's thoughts. But let's listen to Jesus' thoughts first. Let's compare what we're hearing with what the Word of God already says. The Word of God is time-tested. It is true. Let's be friends of God. Let's be in relationship with Christ, the most important. And let's let God influence our relationship with other people. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Thank you for taking the time to log in this morning and hear this morning's message. We here at New Harvest Anaheim truly appreciate the time that you have taken to hear God's word. But before you tune out, we would I love am a friend to of pray God. with you if you have never accepted Jesus into your heart. Or maybe for those of you that have accepted Jesus into your heart, but you've strayed, you've fallen away, this prayer is also for you. Right there where you are, if you don't mind bowing your head and repeating this prayer, we are going to pray the prayer of salvation. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and change me. I know that you died on the cross for me. And I know that you rose from the dead. And now I ask that you live in me. Forgive me and make me the person you want me to be. In Jesus' name, I give you my life. Amen. If you said that prayer, we are excited for you. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. And I know God has a lot in store for you. He has a purpose for you. Please reach out to us. Let us know that you said that prayer. Give us an email at info at newharvestanaheim.com. We would love to connect with you. We would love to know that you prayed and accepted Jesus Christ so that we can rejoice with you. And you can also connect with us via our webpage at www.newharvestanaheim.com. We also have social media platforms and Facebook, at Instagram, and at Twitter, where you can also see what New Harvest is all about and what we are doing here in New Harvest Anaheim. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, New Harvest Anaheim. Thank you and God bless. Now at this time, we would like to give you an opportunity to partner with us in your giving. There are three ways to give. You can give at www.newharvestanaheim.com by simply clicking the Donate Now button. You can also download the free app called Easy Tide. Once you're in the app, you simply type in New Harvest Anaheim and you will be able to donate via your app. Now there's a third way you can give and that's via text on your smartphone. If you would like to use this option, the number is 714-677-8773.
Now for those of you that are the faithful, that log in to hear the New Harvest Anaheim messages, I would like to give you a reminder out of the Word of God in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. God says, will a man rob God, yet you rob me? How do we rob God? He says, through your tithes and your offerings. You see, God wants us to give our tithes and our offerings. And when we don't, we're robbing God. God wants us to give so that His house may continue to provide spiritual food for those in Please, partner with us at New Harvest Anaheim through your tithes and your offerings, and you shall be blessed.